Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Anna Steck. I work, uh, I'm Professor in Fire Chemistry and Toxicity, and I work at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, today, my talk will be on firefighters' exposure to toxic fire effluents. Um, there is no debate that firefighters' occupation is one of the most hazardous ones, um, uh, particularly looking at a replacement of the natural products with the plastics over the last decade. And uh, we know that uh, widespread use of plastic uh, not only increases the growth and severity of the fires, but also it produced much higher concentration and different types of the toxicants that will pose a threat to a human. And yet, if we look at the regulations, uh, we know fire smoke is the biggest killer in fires. Uh, however, outside of mass transportation, it's completely unregulated. Um, therefore, if we've got any fire, we kind of it's very difficult to identify what fire toxins are released and what potential effect they might have on a human. Um, there are two major factors uh, affecting um, um, exposure, um, and that's fire scenario, that's ventilation condition. Uh, so, for example, uh, non-flaming or flaming and fuel. And having those two things in terms of the fire condition and fuel, we can expect different combination of fire effluents and uh, different concentrations, different types and different profile. Additionally to that, depending on a uh, fuel, we will have, depending on their chemical uh, reactions, we will have also exposure in terms of the gases and particulate um, uh, matter. Uh, that means it's in a gas and it's in the atmosphere. We've got also within the longer term deposition uh, on the soil or water runoff. And then we've got also contamination from fire debris. Additionally, to the firefighter exposure to smoke, we're looking at their practices um, and also workplace um, conditions and so on, which I'm going to cover a bit later on in a more detail. In terms of the toxicological evaluation, we classify uh, fire toxicants as acute, uh, those ones which would have immediate effect, and chronic, uh, which would take a time to lead to the health outcome. And that means long term toxicants. And depending on a fuel, we might expect different types of toxicants. So, for example, if we've got nitrogen containing fuel, such as polyurethane foam or polyisocyanate foam, they containing nitrogen. So, fire emissions that we expect would be such as hydrogen cyanide, nitrogen oxide, ammonia. Uh, if we go for the PVC, polyvinyl chloride, for example, window frame, uh, that contains chlorine. So the gases that would be in a major distribution would be hydrochloric acid. Every single fire would produce carbon monoxide and particulate matter. And also in terms of the chronic toxicants, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, that's what we clearly can see as a suit. In terms of the chronic toxicants, uh, the most common ones that we are aware of, uh, such as dioxin furans coming from halogenated products, similarly flame retardants, which are uh, also halogenated, so contain chlorine, uh, bromine or phosphorus. We've got perfluorinated chemicals such as PFAS or metals. And depending on the type of the toxicant, they will have also the different health outcome. So in terms of the toxicological endpoint, we can look at the carcinogenic effect that leads to cancer, we can have, for example, respiratory effect that's got effect on lungs, cardiovascular on heart, and so on. Um, there is really huge wide amount of the studies coming from US and Canada. And in those countries, we already have presumptive legislation which linking firefighter occupation to cancer. Uh, however, uh, within the most recent years, we can see much greater activity, and that was expressed, for example, in 2018, where President Donald Trump signed legislation which required set up registry of firefighters just to track their links between the workplace exposure and cancers. Uh, last year, um, International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, World Health Organization, actually found direct link and classified occupational exposure as a firefighter to be carcinogenic. And in December last year, the US Senate actually approved um, the act 
to provide automatic workers' compensation benefits. That means that in a close future, firefighters do not have to or do not have to do any longer uh, present evidence on their exposure during their career to carcinogens. However, very little has been done in Europe or in UK. In Europe, the most widely studies are coming from Scandinavian countries and really well documented. However, in the UK, there was very, very little published till within the last few years. And um, so Euclid was commissioned by the Fire Brigades Union to see uh, or identify association, if any, between fire toxicants exposure and the increased occurrence of cancers and diseases among firefighters, which were really well documented in other countries. Um, and the outcome that was, it was just that to, we can offer preventative health monitoring, education and support that is specifically designed to protect firefighters' health. The first um, part of the work was actually to uh, carry on a contamination survey. Uh, that took three months, uh, three years ago. Uh, it's covered 64 questions. We open only this to the serving firefighters because we wanted to know the current state uh, and um, awareness or culture, be um, culture behaviours uh, amongst uh, UK firefighters. We were really enormously uh, impressed because we managed to get around 11,000 responses. That's more or less around 24% of the UK workforce. Um, and um, the parts that we cover in the survey were demographics, uh, but also workplace contamination, contaminants on the personal protective equipment, personal protective equipment in terms of its own. Uh, we also look at the health um, in terms of the cancer and mental health and culture and awareness. And that's what I'm going to discuss a little bit more on my further slides. Uh, all those um, all those results that I'm presenting today are already published. Uh, they they are open uh, open publications, so it means that anyone can access and download them. And uh, they are kind of referenced at the bottom of the screen. So if we look for the part one, uh, we look actually at the firefighters and contaminants at the workplace. We found that only one third of firefighters actually clean their PPE after every incident. Um, almost half of firefighters uh, indicating clean and dirty PPE is not stored separately, which means that there is cross-contamination and the firefighters' exposure to those contaminants. More than half of firefighters, uh, we learned also that they store fire gloves within other items of PPE, such as helmets, boots, tunic, trousers or po pockets. Um, that means that if you've got gloves in the helmet, you exposing your hair and your head skin uh, to the contaminants that might be then uh, having a further health uh, outcome. The other thing we learned, which was a bit more worrying, is that 84% of firefighters told us that they often or sometimes attend fires without respiratory protection. And that actually shows lack of enforcement because the major things that came out, as you can see on a graph, came from the habit. Nobody else wears it. Uh, I don't have to wear it, so I chose not to, which kind of is begging a question, do we have really policy or any guidance that would be enforced to make sure that actually firefighters can protect uh, themselves from those exposures to those contaminants? Uh, sadly, uh, on the part two, where we look at the cancer, we found that over 4% of UK serving firefighters who responded to the survey, they have already been diagnosed with the cancer. And uh, the other information you could learn was that the most dominant type of the cancer was skin. And skin actually indicates dermal intake or, or um, um, absorption of toxicants through the skin rather than respiratory types of cancers. Uh, the other types of cancers that we also learned were a rare type of cancers, which normally wouldn't be diagnosed in an early age in the general public. We also learned, uh, and you can see on this graph, uh, that there is some link to contaminants at the workplace uh, for firefighters. So in other words, odds ratio, as you've got at the bottom, actually links uh, the likelihood of developing cancer. So if it's higher than one, it means that those firefighters who have been diagnosed with the cancer through the, and they clarified that in the survey, um, 
they were compared to the firefighters who have not been diagnosed with the cancer. So if it's higher than one, it means that there is statistical significance and likelihood of developing cancer. And what we learned is that the firefighters who served more than 15 years, they had around twice likelihood of developing cancer. Then closely related to the workplace exposure to contaminants such as cleaning, not taken seriously at the workplace, um, no uh, separation of um, PPE between clean and dirty zones, smell of fire at the workplace, um, or uh, the other ones. But the other things we also learned that it's also linked to the personal decontamination, such as firefighters eating uh, in contaminated PPE, that kind of likelihood of developing cancer also on almost twice, and remaining in personal protective equipment for more four hours after incident, or soot in nose and throat for over a day, uh, which kind of is also around two times higher. We also looked at the mental health of firefighters. Obviously, there is a lot of data on the mental health that is linked to the uh, uh, to the stress or the traumatic events, but there is really little known in terms of the correlations to the uh, fire contaminants or emissions. Um, so we looked at the firefighters' mental health uh, compared to the English population. And what we learned, as you can see on a graph, the blue one is for the survey firefighters' response and the orange is for the English, English population. We learned that uh, any mental health conditions is really dominant across uh, in amongst firefighters, particularly anxiety and depression, which is almost twice or three times higher. And uh, the other thing that we also looked um, just briefly was part four, where we look at the badge of honor, um, which kind of links us to the culture and awareness on contaminants. And we learned that uh, within the firefighters majority, they believe or the others believe that there is badge of honor amongst the fire rescue service. Um, and it's quite interesting, you can see that Almost half firefighters told us that, yes, it is not me who believes in badge of honor, it's the others. Um, the other factors that we link to the culture and awareness were the firefighters who personally viewed contamination as a badge of honor. They were at least twice as likely to eat with sooty hands, not as soot in nose and throat for a prolonged time, and also smell fire smoke on the body for more than a day, which indicates that the fire contaminants exposure was much higher and therefore it might also lead to the health outcomes in a close in a in a future. Uh, additionally we learned that there was really a uh, lack of awareness on the contaminants issue, uh, particularly lack of training uh, and their health outcomes that are strongly associated with increased smoke contaminants exposure. Uh, at that point with the survey, we identified only really two stations or two brigades, fire brigades, that provided training on the fire contaminants and their health outcomes. So the more recent data that came out this year, uh, we actually look at the cancer uh, among Scottish male firefighters, uh, and that was for 20 years from 2000 to 2020. And what we learned is that uh, the firefighters' death, uh, over 42% of firefighters who are dying, they're dying from cancer, which we call in different meaning malignant neoplasms. That's very closely followed with the circulatory system diseases, which are 28%. Uh, circulatory diseases, uh, in majority, that's heart attack and stroke. Um, that was closely followed with the other diseases such as respiratory, and respiratory diseases uh, linked to the lungs, um, only 6%. That can be linked because at the within the big fire incident, firefighters do wear briefing apparatus. Um, and then we've got also the other types of diseases which are kind of in minority. In terms of the cancers, uh, we really learned uh, that there are specific cancers that are much greater than general public. So we learned, for example, that prostate, uh, leukemia, there are two, three times higher than where we compare to the Scottish population. If we've got cancer with a uh, not known location, that's almost six times higher when we compare to the Scottish uh, population. Additionally, we learned that uh, the firefighters getting cancer much earlier in life when we compare to Scottish population. And we're talking much earlier, we're talking about 15 years earlier. 
So the top peak of uh, cancer mortalities are between 45 to 49 years old. When, when we take uh, general public, it's around 70, 74, not even higher depending on type of the cancer. Additionally, we learned that uh, the firefighters have multiple exposure and routes of exposure. So it's not only by the inhalation of the toxicants, but it's also digestion and it's also skin absorption. Um, and the final thing is that uh, majority of the firefighters who die at that early age, uh, they actually diagnose with the rare cancers, that recovery is very poor and diagnosis is too late, um, which actually, when we look at the health um, screening firefighters, that kind of is introduced in the US and Canada from 45 years old. And uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize from our data is that the true relative risk is really uh, probably larger than what we reported because not all the firefighter uh, occupation is not recorded for every single firefighter. That means that when we're looking at the death certificate and when the firefighter retires and finding another job, the firefighter occupation is not recorded. And therefore all the data, all, all the cases are not reported. So just to finalize uh, today, um, Within the conclusions, uh, I think there are three major parts that really need to be looked carefully. Um, first of all, is really better the contamination policies. Uh, that really something what I provided you that 85% of firefighters do not wear respiratory protection. That really needs to be enforced through the culture change, uh, increasing awareness, but also in introducing something like a guidance or policy. Um, in terms of the preventative health monitoring, currently with the Fire Brigades Union, we are doing health monitoring across the UK for 1,000 firefighters, so we can provide a health package that will be looking at the early detection of uh, cancers amongst UK firefighters, so those cancers can be detected early and firefighters have a chance to recover and come back to their normal life. And on those notes, on those notes, I will thank you for your attention and uh, probably looking forward for questions. Thank you. Welcome back to Fire by Live. My name is Rebecca Spain and I'm the Managing Editor here at International Fire Buyer. So I'm here with Professor Anna Steck after her presentation on the occupational health risks in firefighters and the preventative measures to minimise their exposure in fire toxins. So Professor Steck, why Fire Buyer Live? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I do think that it is really interesting platform that we're having after the COVID. Uh, that you can disseminate results much wider and probably much more effective way, uh, especially looking at your audience that it will come and listen it. Uh, obviously, my talk cover only firefighters, but it's not really only firefighters who are turning the fire incidents. You've got also the ad different agencies. And probably that's the reason why I actually uh, sent uh, a short abstract to you saying that it would be really good if you can disseminate and show about what we've done and uh, how we can actually work together. Perfect, thank you. So how did you end up where you are now? Well, um, how did I end up? Um, so I started a while ago. Um, uh, from the background, I'm a chemist uh, and I started looking at the uh, analytical chemistry, so the fire emissions from different products. So I started in a very friendly world, uh, combustible insulation materials. Um, looking at the toxicity and toxic emissions. Um, then I looked closely at the flame retardant and somehow that I thought I would have a little bit of break. Um, I moved to firefighter world. Um, and uh, yes, um, that's also a very interesting world that uh, is around us. Uh, so there is still also uh, taking it a bit more serious. There is a lot to be done and we actually have a catching game with the other countries at the moment. And I do believe that fire toxicity is, is important. Most definitely. So the results of the survey that you discussed in your presentation are actually quite shocking. How can we enforce this change in training awareness? And is this a legislative change? Uh, I think there are two aspects. One is start working together. 
Uh, so, and what do I mean by that is that uh, different agencies, uh, different sectors really need to get together to address the issue. Uh, because really, realistically, if I'm talking about fire toxicity, that's for the over two decades, it is elephant in a room. And really, there is a lot of um, issues with that to be addressed, um, something what we can see clearly from the Grenfell Tower fire. Um, from the legislative uh, perspective, uh, we typically in the UK, uh, we've got um, for the presumptive legislation, for example, for firefighters, we need to document an evidence that firefighters have cancers twice higher, which we did. And that's kind of up to the government to take an action and progress that. Uh, in terms of the firefighters exposure to contaminants, that means that policy needs to be or kind of some type of the guidance needs to be really enforced uh, to make sure that firefighters starting changing their habits. So how can health monitoring be adapted quickly? Um, well, um, the, the first thing that I've got that obviously you've got US and Canada that are offering health monitoring, but I want to be very careful with that because when we look at the Canadians and Americans, they've got different types of fuels and therefore different types of toxicants leading to slightly different types of cancers. So the predominance of the cancer's incidence and cancer mortality might be and is slightly different than we've got in the UK. So uh, what we're doing with Fire Brigades Union is that project for the next 24 months where we monitoring blood and urine from 1000 firefighters and is screening for almost every single type of the cancer and disease to identify the best health package that can be then introduced and hopefully implemented in the UK. And what are the current chemicals used in PPE? Um, right, uh, so there is a lot of different types of chemicals, uh, but the most common in the firefighters PPE are perfluorinated chemicals, PFAS, uh, which are identified that they, they have a deleterious effect uh, on, uh, um, on the health. Um, however, what I want to stress is that um, because we do not regulate chemicals in terms of what is put into the product, uh, so if we look more even more general class uh, gas phase halogenative flame retardants, which are put it in the upholstery furniture, for example, because we do not regulate what chemicals are put it in and we do not regulate phytocity what's coming off, it's really, um, you know, we will not know how dangerous it is until it's got the effect. And so what further research needs to be conducted in your field in, in, in regards to long term firefighting health? Um, I think probably where we're looking is, um, as I mentioned, health monitoring uh, that ideally would be introduced and giving firefighters chances to recover and actually to discover that cancer early enough. Um, and I would say probably that's the top on my agenda at the moment through the research. The other aspects that I'm looking at uh, with the Fire Brigades Union is wildland fires and high occurrence of the cardiovascular diseases so, such as heart attack and stroke. Because um, wildland fires, especially when we've got in the UK, they are really different than, you know, big Californian fires. In the UK, you've got mostly smoldering fires, which toxicologically, they will release much bigger cocktail of toxicants with potential damages, deleterious health effect. So that's something that we really should start working on, looking at the emissions and their health on the firefighter, particularly that firefighters do not wear necessary protection during those fires. Um, and yeah, and then use of chemicals. Uh, that's another big, big issue. Well, thank you so much for your time, Professor Steck. It's been really nice to ask you further questions about your presentation. I do invite all of you attending to please connect with her on the platform if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you for your invite. Thank you.